Welcome to World Affairs Today, brought to you by the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C., a leading forum for global education and international affairs. My name is Stephanie Fassler, and I'm the International Affairs Program Director for the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C. On behalf of the Council, I welcome you to this Distinguished Speaker Series event and World Affairs Today program, featuring Dr. Kingsley Molu, former Deputy Governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria. In August of 2014, President Barack Obama hosted the U.S.-Africa Leaders Summit, the largest such gathering between an American president and the heads of African states. One of the focuses of this summit was on trade and investment in Africa. The White House cited it as one, as one of the world's most dynamic and fastest growing regions. Certainly, Africa offers a multitude of business opportunities for both its domestic and international companies. How can these opportunities be cultivated for the wider benefit of the various countries and populations which inhabit the continent? Tonight's speaker will put forth his vision and plan for this last frontier of the global economy. To introduce our distinguished speaker and program participants, I now welcome Dr. Yaya Musa, a member of the Board of Directors of the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C. Thank, Thank you, Stephanie. Good evening and welcome to the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C. My name is Yaya Musa. Uh, as Stephanie pointed out, I'm a member of the Board of Directors of the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C., and I'm the Vice Chairman. Here is the Chairman of the International Affairs Committee uh, of the Board. It is a real pleasure and honor to introduce Honorable Campos, my fellow World Affairs Council Board member, who will serve as a discussant tonight, and Dr. Mugalu, sitting next to him, the distinguished speaker. These two exceptionally talented guests have a lot in common, as you will soon realize. Let me first introduce Honorable Campos. He is currently a partner at the law firm Lock Lord where he is a national chair of securities regulation and enforcement. Quoting from his company's website, Mr. Campos' role consists in, I am quoting, defending corporate management teams and boards of directors with respect to the Securities and Exchange Commission enforcement, Foreign Corrupt Practice Act and internal investigation, criminal prosecutions, securities and international regulation, and corporate governance. As you can see, Mr. Campos' portfolio of responsibilities covers a wide range of strategically important financial areas. Prior to his present position at Lock Lord, his law firm, during 2002-2007, Mr. Campos was appointed by President George Bush as Commissioner at the Securities and Exchange Commission. Mr. Campos is a respected authority on matters pertaining to financial regulation, securities law, and corporate governance. Before joining the Securities and Exchange Commission, Mr. Campos was a media entrepreneur and an owner of a radio broadcasting corporation in Houston, Texas. Mr. Campos holds a law degree from Harvard University, a business degree from the University of California at Los Angeles, and a degree from the U.S. Air Force Academy. Let me now turn to Dr. Mogalu, our tonight's distinguished speaker. Like uh, Mr. Campos, Dr. Kinsley Mogalu is another expert on financial regulations. Indeed, 
from November 2009 to November 2014, meaning yesterday, Dr. Mogalu was the deputy governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria. In that capacity, he had been in charge of prudential regulations of bank and financial institutions, and also his country, he was involved in shaping his country monetary policy. He was also a member of the federal government of Nigeria's economic management team. Prior to his joining the central bank of his native Nigeria, Dr. Mugalu had spent 17 years with the United Nations in various capacities and in various countries, including Cambodia, Croatia, Tanzania, and Switzerland, where he later started his own consultancy business. A prolific and insightful writer, Dr. Mogalu is the author of Rwanda's Genocide, 2005, Global Justice, published in 2008, and more recently, of Emerging Africa, the topic of our tonight's discussion, Emerging Africa, how does the global economy's last frontier can prosper and matter, published this year, 2014. Dr. Mogalu holds a master's degree from Tufts University's Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy and a PhD from the London School of Economics. Without further ado, please join me in warmly welcoming Dr. Mogalu to the podium. First Council uh, for having me this evening uh, to speak to you on the subject of emerging Africa, how the global economy's last frontier can prosper and matter, which is the subject of this book, uh, just published this year by Penguin. Um, Africa has been in the news lately. Um, until very, very lately, it was in the news for very good reasons. And most recently, it was in the news for Ebola, um, which, like all bad news, um, will go away. Um, but I, I want to talk to you about Africa as an economic opportunity. First of all, for Africans, and secondly, of course, for the whole world, possibly as part of the creation of a global sphere of prosperity. And so that's why the topic of my book is Emerging Africa, how the global economy's last frontier can prosper and matter. The title of this book is very loaded. First of all, notice that I use the word emerging. I didn't say Africa rising. Because when you read the book, you will see what I have to say about whether or not Africa is rising. And that's in fact uh, a subject I interrogate uh, quite uh, seriously in the book. Um, it's conventional wisdom to believe that Africa is rising. And I certainly believe Africa can rise. But is Africa rising? I have my um, reservations about that, and I discuss it in the book. But without question, Africa is emerging in the world's economic consciousness. And that's why the book is titled Emerging Africa. And then I, again, call it how the global economy's last frontier. And I use the phrase last frontier in quotes because the question is, whose last frontier is Africa? It's frequently referred to as the last frontier of the global economy. But it's not my last frontier, certainly not. It's my first frontier because I'm an African. And so I use the phrase last frontier in quotes. And then I go on to say, how can this quote, last frontier, prosper and matter? Because there are two things. First, you, have to, you, you could matter without prospering. But it's better if you matter because you prosper. Um, 
I mean, some parts of the world matter greatly, but they're not prosperous. Um, and so I don't want the African continent to matter to anybody else without being prosperous, because that's an incomplete type of mattering. You could say, indeed, that the continent has mattered for a very long time. For 500 years, Africa has been the subject of global interest. But in what sense? It's been predominantly a place of extraction of wealth to create global prosperity, to create pros prosperity for the United States, to create prosperity for the British Empire, and so on and so forth. And now, in this current phase of globalization, you have a huge upsurge and interest in foreign investment in Africa. So again, the continent matters, but for whom? And why does it matter? I begin by saying, yes, Africa is on, people believe Africa is on the rise. But is this a real rise? And is it necessarily, the way this rise is proceeding, is it what will bring development to Africa? And I conclude that broadly, the answer is no that Africa can rise, but for Africa to rise, a number of fundamental requirements must be met. Because first of all, we've got to understand what does development mean and who defines development. Development, in my view, means that a people or a society have progressively improving quality of life. They have good schools, they have good hospitals, um, they have good infrastructure, and progressively they develop good institutions. To me, that is what development fundamentally means. Now, development is not necessarily the same as Africa has very high GDP growth rates, which is a story we hear a lot. For the past 10, 15 years, Africa's GDP growth has been quite significant, an average of 7% a year. And that's not bad. But you could have a lot of GDP growth without a lot of development. And this is something that a lot of people miss. The question is, how many millions or hundreds of millions of people in Africa are being transported or transposed from poverty to a different class, the middle class. That's what development is about. And it's important to have the right mindset so that we can ask ourselves the fundamental questions that will lead us as Africans to pursue the agenda of our development in, a, in an appropriate manner, in a manner that actually results in the development of that continent. We've been talking about development for a long time, but how much development has actually taken place? So, in the book, I begin by discussing the new Africa rising um, euphoria. And I say it's a good thing because for a number of reasons, the conflicts in Africa that gave Africa such a bad image in the past have very largely died down. And so it's a continent that is broadly at peace. A few pockets of conflicts here and there, but not anywhere near what it used to be um, in decades past, when the continent was known for nothing but wars and famine and children with flies on their mouths and their bellies. That era is beginning to disappear. And a lot of people around the world begin to see Africa now as a place where business can be done and good money made. In other words, it is becoming part of the new normal. And that's a good thing. And a number of reasons have brought this about. First of all, like I said, the end of the wars. Um, also, increased macroeconomic stability in Africa. Over the past 20 years, inflation has broadly come down in Africa. You've got much more independent central banks managing monetary policy. Time has long since passed when a president of a, of a country in Africa could call a central bank governor and say, look, print me some money. 
We need the printing, the printing presses rolling. We need money to prosecute this war or to do that or to do that. Of course, inflation is the result. That era is gone. You've got increasingly better macroeconomic fiscal management by fiscal authorities in, the, in our continent. And so macroeconomically speaking, the continent is broadly stable. Now, another reason why Africa has been in the news in the last few years, and in a positive way, is because of something very negative that happened elsewhere. And that is the global financial crisis and the Great Recession which, of course, devastated the mature markets of the Western world. And so, with value thus destroyed, capital will always go to where it will make profit. That's the nature of capital. And so, a lot of people began to perforce discover Africa. Because the continent had a low correlation with the global financial system, and so was not as affected by the global financial crisis as the more mature economies. Meanwhile, it has a very fast-growing population. Africa is projected to be, right now, 15% of the world's population. But at some point, projections point to the fact that it could be 50% of the world's population in, in some years to come, in another 20, 25, 30 years, if certain trends continue. Broadly, the population growth trend is declining but it's declining the least in Africa. And in some places in the continent, it's rising. This has implications that I will discuss. But back to the question of why Africa is in the news. Now, I talked, about, I talked a lot about the macroeconomic situation in the continent being very stable. And that's a fundamental requirement for development. But does that mean that Africa is rising? And I answer that question by saying, no, it doesn't mean that Africa is rising. That that development, together or combined with the uh, increasing interest in the continent, increasing foreign investment in the continent, means there is an opportunity. That is what exists in Africa today. There's an opportunity for the African continent to actually fulfill its potential as part of a or as a co-creator of global economic prosperity. The reason it does not amount to Africa rising is very, very simple. We need to ask ourselves certain questions. Do African countries now have industrial manufacturing economies? The answer is no. Do African countries have very, very developed or sophisticated service economies? The answer is no. Now, Africa's recent economic boom has been based largely, but not completely, but largely on raw materials exports. The usual cycle, what it has been for so long, that African countries export raw materials, unfinished products, minerals, whether it's and, and other things, you know, crude oil in my country, Nigeria. Nigeria is a crude oil exporter. But today, we see the geopolitical and the geoeconomic trends that are developing in the global oil markets. The United States has become uh, self-sufficient in oil production with shale oil and, and gas. And they no longer buy oil from Nigeria anymore. They were once, uh, Nigeria was once a very important important supplier of oil to the United States. Today, that is not the case. So, and then you have shale. Now you have, um, you know, oil prices going down and affecting oil producers. And Nigeria's economy has once again become very vulnerable. When an economy is structured in this manner, that economy has not yet risen. And so that's why I disagree with those who say that Africa is rising. And I say that Africa can rise. But for Africa to rise, a number of things must first happen. What are those things that must first happen for Africa to rise? The first thing that must happen is that African countries themselves must interrogate, frame, and situate globalization. Globalization has become a powerful force. 
in our world today. Two things transmit the currents of globalization. Technology and culture. These are the driving forces of technology. Incidentally, in the area of the cultural side of globalization, you see Africa actually coming into the mix quite a lot. African fashion has gone global. African music is going global. And so that's good, but that's the soft side of globalization. The hardware of globalization, which determines where each nation ranks on the totem pole of prosperity, is technology. And where is Africa when you come to that requirement of technology? Not yet where it should be. Nowhere near where it should be. So the whole paradigm of globalization, African countries need to understand that globalization is not benign in its intent. It is not agnostic in its belief. Globalization is an agenda and it is an agenda that is driven by the globalizers because the globalizers have strategic intent to dominate. And that strategic intent to dominate is pushed through efficient manufacturing, competitive production, export of value-added goods, and domination of markets, local, regional, foreign. And so if Africa today has only 3% of world trade and less than 5% of global foreign investment, can you say that Africa is rising? I don't think so. If you don't understand globalization as a concept and as a context in which Africa is seeking to play a larger role in the global economy, and meanwhile that economy is dominated by the phenomenon of globalization today as we speak, then how can you find your way forward? If you don't understand accurately and position yourself on or around the force that is driving prosperity in the modern world, then you have a problem. And so that's why the whole subject of globalization, whether it's globalization of trade, liberalization of markets, and all those things, it's important that African countries take a thorough philosophical approach to it. The second thing that I discuss in the book that is absolutely necessary and perhaps is the most fundamental requirement for Africa to actually become prosperous is that African countries need to develop a worldview. And that is to say they need to develop a mental infrastructure that is absolutely foundational for prosperity. It's the mind that creates wealth. It's the mind that creates progress. It's the mind that creates prosperity. And so if you don't deal with the mind and the mindset and you are flailing around or you are just, you know, participating in the usual moves or the usual activities, activities don't develop people. Strategy develops people. A worldview, and that strategy must be based on a worldview. It's a strategy that gives life to a worldview. And what is a worldview? I discuss it in the book. That is that African countries need to develop a view of the world and their place in the world. Where Africa is coming from, where Africa is, where Africa is going, how Africa is going to get to where it is going. The value systems that have to become part of African societies for Africa to be able to get to where it has set out as its goal. The strategy, the theory of action the knowledge systems, how do we acquire and absorb knowledge? Very important. And this is transmitted through educational systems. What are the building blocks of the African worldview? For far too long, Africa has been blown about by every wind of doctrine. Today, it's the Washington Consensus. Tomorrow, it's the Beijing Consensus. But where is the African Consensus? Where is the African view of the world that springs from its own self, from its own consciousness, as a legitimate and proud part of humanity? 
that it actually once was. Because you must first understand history for you to develop a worldview. I mean, history has been airbrushed, we know, for so many years. But Africa, historically, was once a leading civilization. And it's important for Africans themselves to understand this. Because if you don't understand it, then you may have a false view of your own history and see yourself only in the more modern historical context in which things like slavery in the New World, in which things like colonialism have tended to be what defines the African condition or large parts of it. But that's a very recent view of history. But because we don't have good historical memory, that recent view of history has tended to overshadow many other epochs of history that are just as important as the more recent part of it. The first issue is globalization. The second issue is the worldview. And these are the two foundations that have to be built in Africa. So having discussed these two foundations, what else now do I do in the book? Against this, this, this foundation, what I call the philosophical foundations of prosperity, and when I talk about worldviews, I use the example of the United States or the Western worldview and the Western economic power or the Western economic structure in the modern world, and I use it and compare it with the Eastern, the rise of the East in the world today, the rise of China, to show you how worldviews matter. I want you to know that until three, four centuries ago, the world was poor. Poverty has actually been a far more consistent condition of world history than wealth. The only people who were wealthy were the kings and those who had access to gold and things like that. But most of humanity has been poor for a very long time. What created the stupendous wealth that we take for granted today in the modern world was the Industrial Revolution, innovation, and the technology that came from it. That's what created the light bulb, Michael Faraday discovering electricity. That's what created the steam engine, Thomas Watt. That's what created uh, Thomas Edison's main inventions. And then he founded the General Electric Company. Today, paradoxically, GE's business strategy is very heavily targeted at Africa. And that's a good thing. So the Western worldview was based on two things. Scientific rationalism, when the West began to question the ecclesiastical, ecclesiastical, ecclesiastical uh, world order, that is people believing that everything can be explained away um, you know, in a religious context. And they, they began to say, well, you know, the world is round, it's not flat, and proved it. So rational scientific inquiry led to innovation. Innovation led to economic uh, prosperity for the modern Western world. The second element of the Western worldview is individual human rights. Again, this led to the development of institutions, strong institutions, to protect individual rights and individual freedoms in many Western countries. So this is the Western worldview that has driven the prosperity of the Western world. Now, what's the worldview of the East? What's the worldview of China? They have, I can tell you, and I kid you not, a very different worldview. The Chinese worldview is based on a number of things. One, a sense of time that is very, very long and far. The Chinese think in 50, 100, 200 year frame, mind frames. They don't think short term. The Chinese believe that stability is an end in itself. And because stability is an end in itself, the society is far more important than the individual. This is a very different type of worldview. The point I'm trying to make is that worldviews are subjective, but they build objective realities that are called world orders. So you look at the Western worldview, you look at the Asian worldview, but both have created prosperity. One was dominant, one is rising and challenging 
the previously dominant worldview. The rise and fall of civilizations, the rise and fall of nations, the rise and fall of great powers is based on a fierce and consistent, never-ending battle of worldviews. And so, where is Africa in all this? So if you don't have your worldview, where are you going? I always say, as an, individu as an individual, I never leave home without my worldview. It's my American Express card. It's who I am. It's how I see the world. I have a view of the world. I know exactly where I think I'd like to be. And I think I know how to get there, or I know what I, at least I should do in order to get there. And I dare say, at least at a very personal level, that that has helped me against all odds. So you've got to have that worldview. Africans need to understand that, that you know, they have to think it through. Reflection, developing a consensus of what development means is very important for Africa. If they don't do that, that's a foundational thing, then other people will define development for them. Other people will define development for them. Or passing or transient trends and fashions will define what development means for them. Development has meant different things for Africa for the past 50 years. At one point, it was mostly socialist uh, systems, or at least mixed economies in many countries, based on the Cold War and where each African country lined up. Were you with the West or were you with Russia? And so that affected the economic thinking in the government and how the economy was um, designed and controlled and regulated and so on. Now, so at some point, capitalism has become, now everybody's a capitalist. But capitalism is not new in Africa. It was the original economic system in Africa. It was, it was the colonial intervention that twisted this reality when some countries moved their way to socialist planning. But African countries have always been capitalists. But a certain type of capitalist, not the extreme free-for-all, free market. There was a sense of community in African societies. So, so the point I'm trying to make is that when you now understand globalization, when you understand, when you have developed a view of the world and your place in the world, that Africa should have its own place under the sun and that nobody's going to give that place to Africa except Africa itself asserts that place and works to maintain it, you're not going to have that place under the sun. Somebody, um, I, I think it was Yaya when he was speaking, um, or was it Stephanie, talked about the U.S.-Africa Leaders Summit. That's very interesting. And let me talk a little bit about that. It's a very good development that America is waking up to the potential of Africa. But, but, I want to submit to you that Africa's destiny will never be decided in foreign capitals. It will never be decided in summits with world leaders it will never be decided in Washington. It will never be decided in Beijing. It will never be decided in Delhi. It will never be decided in Istanbul or all the other rising or present or aspiring world powers who all invite African leaders to partnership summits. The, the interaction is important and necessary, but it's important that Africa come to those interactions with clear objectives that they want to achieve. That's the point I'm trying to make. I'm not saying the summit is wrong. The summit is good. But what should be the focus of the summit? If everybody's interest in investing in Africa is about importing goods into Africa, it's about a consumerist society that has a rising middle class and everybody's looking at it as a great market and we want to sell our goods into that market, that may be fine for those who are producing those goods, but is it fine for Africa? ultimately and in the long term, strategically thinking. These are the things that African leaders should be thinking about. And so what, for example, should the U.S. relationship with Africa be based on? We had AGOA, the Africa Growth and Opportunity Act, that was uh, passed under the presidency of Bill Clinton. And that act 
was meant to support Africa's economic uh, development, had a very good intention to bring in a lot of goods from Africa into the United States with special dispensations, lower tariffs, and so on and so forth. And about, I think about maybe 3,000 or, or so more goods were identified as being eligible um, uh, for AGOA, AGOA uh, privileges. But how many years now AGOA hasn't done what it was meant to do? Because 80% of US trade with Africa under AGOA has been based on oil. That's the truth. And so that's the problem. So if you want to make AGOA work, you find, for example, that a lot of the products that could come in are not coming in because either um, the standards of the finished products are not of the quality that would make it pass through the necessary tests, or you find that there has just not been an emphasis on exporting finished value-added products and negotiating a space for those products. So the easy way out is to import raw materials. And that's what has happened for a long time on the Agoa. Now, at this summit, a lot of people brought this up in Washington and said, this has to change. And I think we can all agree that this has to change. So when Africa is discussing its relationship with the United States, one of the things that Africa should be discussing with the United States is how to get American companies to invest in the things that will fundamentally create a capability in Africa to produce manufactured processed goods that can become part of regional or world trade. And so, for example, and that's why the, um, um, uh, the Power Africa uh, initiative by President Obama is a very good initiative. It's excellent because it goes to the heart of the problem. You can't have development in a country that doesn't have electricity, in a continent that doesn't have electricity. And so raising the wattage of electricity production in Africa is a fundamental priority because Africans themselves are very entrepreneurial people. If you have a lot of light, a lot of ideas will come to a lot of entrepreneurs and they can execute those ideas at very low costs. But because you don't have good and efficient electricity, the cost of production of everything, because everybody has a generator. And we call it, jokingly, I am better than my neighbor. Because it's like, how big is your generator? Is yours very noisy? Does it give off all these fumes? Or is it like my type, silent? Just gives me electricity. So I'm better than my neighbor. So but that's the wrong <laughs> comparison. You know, so the investments in electricity production in Africa, fundamental. So if you're negotiating with the United States, that's what you should be talking about. You should be talking about processed agriculture. You should be talking about creating hubs of innovation and how can African countries be supported or how can we collaborate with the United States in the area of innovation. Because when you innovate and you commercialize your innovations, that's how prosperity is created. These are the kinds of strategic areas where economic relationships between Africa and the United States should be uh, focusing on. So, but after laying the foundations, what the book then does is that I now use these, what I call the philosophical foundations of prosperity to now interrogate some things. First, foreign aid. Foreign aid. Oh, don't get me started. I don't believe in it. Why? Because I ask a question, and nobody has given me the answer. Show me any society that became an industrial power in the modern world through foreign aid. It doesn't exist. Development is by definition how a society internally creates and channels its own energy to industrial production, to economic production in an efficient manner. That is the meaning of development. Development is not, you, you, you hear a phrase that is very popular, international development. So there is an assumption 
in that phrase that somehow some international entity or some international interaction can create a developed society somewhere else. That, I submit to you, is not true. And that's why despite 50, 60 years of foreign aid, hundreds of billions and maybe even trillions of foreign aid, African countries have not made the fundamental developmental leap that they need to make. That's because the very model of development that is based on an outsider giving you money or something else is wrong. Now, I'm not saying that in every circumstance. There may be some circumstances in which it is helpful or wise or strategic to obtain some assistance or the other. But to make this a model of development, which is what the foreign aid business has projected itself as in the past, I think that clearly that has failed. We've seen it. And we've seen it because a lot of people in recent times, in the last 10, 15, 20 years, aid is no longer as important in Africa as it used to be. But it's still too important for my comfort. It's still too important to some countries, especially the smaller countries. And so when we're talking about Africa's transformation, that's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about GDP growth. I'm talking about economic transformation. You've got to rethink foreign aid. Now, if foreign aid, for example, were to be about a lot of focus on hospitals, that is to say social infrastructure, a lot of focus on education, a lot of focus on training teachers with technical skills to impart it into generations of Africans, a lot of emphasis on funding the commercialization of innovation, a lot of young, brilliant inventors in Africa, but they don't have venture capital backers. So if foreign aid, for example, were to be tilted in this direction, it could have some impact, but it still in itself wouldn't necessarily be the full solution, but it would help much more than has been the case. Instead, we find that foreign aid has for far too long been a, a method for the projection of worldview. Every rising power that develops a worldview wants to project its power. And the first way that it wants to do that is to begin to give aid to those who need it. Brazil, India, China, they are now competing with the West in the foreign aid business because they feel they've arrived. So who are we going to aid? When we aid, we are powerful. When we aid, we can suggest to you quietly how you could possibly vote in the United Nations General Assembly on certain matters of strategic interest to us. So these are the things about foreign aid. And so when you build a development model that is based on handouts, you're going nowhere. So the point I'm trying to make is that you've got to, um, African countries have to, do this. They have to look at foreign aid and really say, is this the path to progress? No. They've got to look at capitalism. Yes, it has great potential, but we've got to manage it. We've got to understand it. And so after that, I now begin to discuss some more practical things. I first of all look at Nigeria, uh, which is Africa's largest economy today by GDP. And ever since Nigeria rebased its economy, um, then the, um, ever since Nigeria rebased its economy, um, now it's called the largest economy in Africa, and the South Africans have taken to calling themselves the most sophisticated economy in Africa. So the Nigerians say we're the largest, the South Africans say we're the most sophisticated. That's, that's okay. So I discuss that, and then I discuss other applications of these philosophical foundations of prosperity in the book. I discuss foreign investment, I discuss the role of science and technology and innovation, I discuss the um, you know, the role of the, the nature of the international society, the role of the IMF and the World Bank and things like that. Um, and then I discuss something that you don't find in many books about uh, Africa. Uh, I discuss strategy and risk management. How do you deploy strategy and the management of risk to create transformation in Africa? And then I come to a close by looking at Africa and China. And I show very clearly that China is not Africa's enemy, but it's not necessarily Africa's friend. 
The only thing that matters in international relations is self-interest. China is looking out for its own interest. China has a clear policy towards Africa. But what is Africa's policy towards China? And I wrap up the book with a historical view uh, where I go, I take, I take a sweep of history uh, coming back to the present time. Again, ending with the role of technology and how Africa cannot step into the African century without deploying, adapting, building its own technology with which they can engage globalization on their own terms. Thank you. Thank you for that um, very enlightening speech and um, very insightful from your perspective about Africa. Uh, I'm sure the audience appreciated it as much as I did. There, there's so many places to go in terms of your, um, your thesis and, and the book. And, um, and, and trying to condense it into uh, min meaningful areas is, is a challenge. But let's begin with um, the idea of, um, of globalization. Now, essentially, I think what you're saying is globalization in and of itself is not a panacea or, a, or necessarily even positive for Africa because it, it tends to be exploitive. It, it, uh, it could create uh, either a market or it create, you know, for others, goods who are produced elsewhere or it extracts commodities and, and uh, you know, maybe not quite in that order. So, uh, so compare globalization and its impact that seems to be positive, let's say to China, yeah. perhaps to India, right? Uh, there in, 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 you know, uh, of course it's difficult because of uh, many different factors, but their globalization would have seemed to have led in China to industrialization which is something that you very clearly say Africa needs. Yeah. So, it, so China, through the phenomena of globalization, ended up creating uh, industrialization, perhaps in smaller uh, you know, volume goods, shall we say, but nonetheless some industrialization. Uh, so why doesn't that, why isn't that same phenomena uh, present in Africa and globalization create mm. industrialization there? Mm. Well, I think, um, I think that um, what, what's missing in Africa is a realization that globalization consists of global supply chains. Now, and so Africa, the reason Africa hasn't been like China is because China decided quite clearly what its own competitive advantages were in globalization. One of it was cheap labor, which China used to be able to drive um, itself into a position in the global economy as the place where things are made. And you know, I was watching a movie the other day, and somebody talked about um, setting up a manufacturing plant in America. And the guy who was supposed to be um, trying to buy the business started laughing. He said, you don't manufacture in America. Everything in America is made in China. You know, and so that was an interesting, uh, teachable moment. Um, so that's, that's what's the big difference. You know, you've got to, the, the Asian countries have positioned themselves somewhere on the global, you know, supply chain. The, the various components of the manufacturing of things. Some of them are made in Asia, made at much lower cost, but even at that lower cost, those economies are benefiting because employment is being created. Uh, and so prosperity is being created. So that's the point I think that's been missing uh, for in African policy and strategy. Um, so Africa needs to find where its own competitive advantages lie. Let me give you an example. Wages are rising in China. And so, of course, a lot of industries are now trying to move from China. Now, if they move from China, where do they move to? Africa could say, OK, if China is becoming expensive for manufacturers, Maybe we should try to attract a lot of those in the, especially light manufacturing. I mean, we've got to be realistic. We've, you've got to start where you, you, can, you can actually uh, compete. So, but for you to have light manufacturing, you need to have skilled labor. Even China is grappling with this uh, challenge, but Africa faces it even more. And so, for example, you could say that if you want to invest in Africa, we welcome as a priority people who will invest in creating the skills that will enable us to attract light manufacturing. This is how to think about globalization. Very interesting. And so, um, 
Did, did China have an advantage? Uh, you talk about you know one of your second points being the worldview, right? Yeah. And and the idea of having uh, a, a sense, a strategy of where a particular country fits in in the overall world economy. Uh, maybe I'm saying that too uh, oh, no, too loosely, yeah. but but essentially that. Sure. So in in China, with its central government. Uh, I suspect, you know, you know in, in the large landmass and large population, um, you know, you could want, you could see where that vision and then the execution could be done very efficiently. Yeah. But in, in Africa, you have, uh, what is it, 50, 54, countries. 54 countries, essentially, right? And so um, that centralization, I'm not saying it's a good thing, but it's not there, obviously. So would it be done country by country? So. If, if there is an opportunity, as you say, let's build on your example. Yeah. Uh, China's getting too expensive, wages are going up, uh, they have to switch per perhaps, right, to more value added to uh, other capital, as the way the U.S. has perhaps, you know, in, in a lesser form. So now Africa wants to seize an opportunity. Yeah. Uh, do we have 50 strategies, you know, in Africa, 54, <laughs> you know, yeah. or, or how, do, yeah. how does that happen? Yeah, I talked about this in the book, um, and I said, look, um, this is something that can be done at two levels. You could, it's important that Africa's leaders, the leaders of Africa's countries, individual countries, begin to have this sense of a worldview. They can create it in their own societies. And I actually make some practical suggestions as to how they can do that. You can craft a national philosophy. You can get a group of wise men across different uh, um, professions and philosophers and thinkers and professionals and traders and women and so on, and form a consensus about what each country believes. That's one level at which to do it. But there's another level at which to do it, and that's the, the level of the African Union. Now, the African Union is trying to craft a vision for Africa called Africa 2063 or something like that. That's to say Africa in another 50 years. This is another, another opportunity at a macro level to create some broad framework of an African worldview, which you can then drill down in detail into individual countries, um, and it doesn't have to be the same in its detail in every country, because every country has different countries of different circumstances. Um, so this is how to go about it. First, at the national level, it's very important so that there's an ownership of it, and then also at... Um, at, um, at the continental level. That's, that's, that's how I look at the whole question. But the consciousness of why there is a need to do this must exist. The, the understanding that this is what actually drives development must exist. And I worry that it doesn't exist as much as it should. And that's what's missing. And that's the message of this book, that we need to think very deeply about where we're going, how we want to get there, why we want to go there. So if, if you, uh, and I know you've thought through these many things, if, if you compare early 19th century America, let's yeah. say, right? So we're talking post Thomas Jefferson, still sure. an, an agricultural country, but yet the first, yeah. you know, uh, textile mills are being formed, you know, uh, short railroads are coming and so forth. Um, how, how did, how do you think it happened in America? Yeah. And how do you think, if you can put, maybe that's not a, a very perfect historical analogy, I but yeah. how, yeah. how would it happen in Africa? Let me tell you that there is something that is common to both situations, as different as they may look to you. You may say, what's, 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 what's common between uh, Thomas Jefferson, um, George Washington, and the drafters of the Constitution and the Federalist Papers, and you know, a community in Africa, West Africa, or East Africa, or whatever. There's one thing that is constant throughout history, and that is leadership. Leadership is the element that transforms societies. It has never fallen to the masses anywhere in the world. It's a rare occurrence, and that's only when maybe leadership becomes too oppressive or something, and then the, the people rise up, with like the French Revolution and all that. But in, in history, we see that it's the role of leaders to shape, to create a desired state of being, a destination to put society's work to. It's the role of leadership. And 
that's why leadership is so critical. And the quality of leadership in the African continent is essential for this to happen. And there are challenges with that. Uh, some of those challenges exist because of a number of cultural issues which need to be addressed. Culture is dynamic. And you cannot take culture completely and totally from a context, one context of just communal existence to leadership of a modern state without looking at what's good about the culture or what's not so good about that culture and perhaps should be left at lower levels of interaction among people. But when it comes to governing a modern state, you've got to think in a certain way that may not necessarily be part of what we consider to be our culture, but we can import it. Um, or you can adapt what your culture is to address what that need is. Mm. So that's the point I'm trying to make. Leadership is the critical factor. No, it's very interesting. I, I would have thought you'd have gone into mercantilism or, or capital from the uh, UK or at that time the British to build the railroads, but uh, certainly no, your you point find, about leadership you know, Yeah, is, it's all is, about leadership. I mean, yeah. you find, when I look at the history of this country, the United States, when, when you look at the, 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 you know, George Washington, who could have been a king, uh, could have been a monarch, but he chose to be a president limited by terms of office. Um, he, he could have copied, you know, the colonial master's way, and, but he, he, he could see because he had a certain level of vision for the new country. It's true. And he was able to make certain sacrifices to his ego or whatever to develop a system of governance for this country. You look at Thomas Jefferson, you look at you know, Alexander Hamilton, you look at the debates, the ideas, the debates over ideas. But in some cultures, you find out that ideas have not been given their proper place of importance. And what you have is individuals or people become very important. Personalities become very important. Absolutely. Small things like, like religion or, 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 or ethnic groups. And those types of things assume an importance that is larger than life. And because and the reason those things assume an importance that is larger than life is because there is really no worldview. So those things replace what should be a, a huge societal worldview that is the duty of leadership to construct. And so you find that in Europe, again, over many years, this was also constructed. It doesn't happen in a day, to be sure, but you find um, that it's, 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 it's a conscious effort that must take place. We have uh, come to the end, and let me just uh, say thank you on behalf of the World Affairs Council, D.C., uh, for your attention and for your support. And uh, we look forward to continuing these kinds of programs where we bring uh, brilliant people, uh, the, the, the best thinkers of our time, uh, to the D.C. Uh, area and um, and we uh, we are very proud of our program and we hope to continue it. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you, Doctor. Thank, Thank, Thank you for joining us for World Affairs Today, a production of the World Affairs Council, Washington D.C. Stay connected with us at www.worldaffairstoday.org.